Welcome back for the, um, the, the final two sessions this afternoon. Um, and we've heard a lot today about uh, what you might describe as macro policy. We're now moving to what you might describe as the kind of MISO policy level, uh, getting closer to the actual front line of what, what clinicians do on the ground. Um, and the NHS has a long history of having three-letter acronyms. Um, <laughs> and it's also spent the last, at least the last 25 years trying to work out how to overcome the, the fragmentation that's been caused by successive reorganizations. So I had a look earlier today at the NHS Confederation acronym buster, uh, which I highly recommend to people. And that lists at least, I, I got bored after a while, at least 20 different acronyms that relate to collaborative working that have been used over the years. So people remember LDPs and HIPs and the like? Yeah, I'm getting a few nods. So what we've got today around our panel are people who represent the latest incarnation <laughs> of those three-letter acronyms that represent system working. We've got colleagues from the ICS, the Integrated Care System, from the ICP, Integrated Care Provider or Partnership, take your choice. In fact, there are three different definitions for ICP on, in the acronym buster. Uh, and colleagues from the PCN. So what I'm going to do is to ask each of them to, to int introduce themselves and to talk to us in turn about, not about their governance structures, but about what they're actually able to do now and the things that they're actually starting to do on the ground that are making a difference to the people who use services. And what they're able to do now that perhaps they couldn't do before, and what, what's still getting in the way for them. So Claire, you're going to, you're going to kick us off. Thanks, Helen. So, hello, I'm Claire Fuller. I'm a GP and I'm the lead for the Surrey Heartlands Integrated Care System. So Surrey Heartlands is, obviously it's not a real place, it's a made up term that describes nearly all of Surrey. We're a wave one ICS and we've got a devolution agreement population about 1.3 million and we have 10 statutory organisations within our footprint. We're nearly co-terminus with our local authority and it's that relationship and that partnership that's critical behind a lot of the work we've done. We've got, we used to have three ICPs, we have now have four, and an ICP for us is an integrated care partnership and describes the flows of, the population flows that go into an acute trust, and we have four acute trusts within our footprint. We have 24 PCNs, so primary care networks. So we now know from the operating guidance what an ICS is there to do, which is lovely, so we're, ICSs are there for system transformation and system performance management. And in my role as ICS lead, I lead assurance of the system. Uh, and I'm surprised, actually, that since I've been here, I haven't heard anybody talk about the magical system by default, which now seems to be the, the new magic phrase that goes on. Uh, the thing I think ICSs are actually about is population health and reducing health inequalities. And I think the best way to describe that, I'm going to give you an example, uh, which is about how we've tackled the first 1,000 days, which is one of our priorities in Surrey Heartlands. So if you look at the early years indicators across Surrey, actually we do better than average. We do very, our children do very well. But what that does when you take it as an average across Surrey is it hides the fact that within that there are pockets of inequalities. So if you lived in a deprived area of Surrey, if you receive free school meals, if you're part of the Gypsy Roma traveller population, if you have a learning disability, or if you're a young carer, your outcomes will be a lot worse. So if you're born in Spelthorne rather than born in Isha, if everything else is equal... Uh, from birth, we already know you will die six years earlier. Free school meals, one of the, one of the early years indicators we look at is uh, your level of development at the end of reception, so age five. On average in Surrey, 78% of our children receive uh, 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 rated as having good levels of development age five. If you receive free school meals, 29% will be rated as having good development, which is just a shocking uh, difference. Gypsy Roman Travellers, we've got, is our, our largest ethnic minority group in Surrey, uh, and we have the second largest population across the country in Surrey, and it's well documented the poor health outcomes for those, for those populations. So what have we done in terms of actually improving the health inequalities for those groups? So we've worked with communities. So rather than doing the, the classic top-down send-out questionnaire, send out a, an invitation, we've actually worked with communities. We've set up a citizen panel that is uh, demographically representative by postcode and over-recruited for carers to make sure that voice is statistically significant. We have an outreach uh, Gypsy Roma traveller worker who goes into the communities. And then particularly, so our immunisation rates are terrible. So in Surrey, our immunisation rates were below herd immunity. So that means in Surrey, people will die from preventable disease. So instead, again, of just sending out letters saying come for an appointment, we've gone to talk to people. And actually, it's what, what's really interesting is there was an assumption it was very much Wakefield driven. But when you actually 
listen to parents. It's about access. They can't get in to get the appointments that they need. The appointments are in the wrong places at the wrong times. And actually what we're starting to do now is work with food banks and do the immunisations there, do mobile clinics at drop-off and pick-up times so that women can bring, also mums can bring their children. To using technology differently, we've got the delightfully named BadgerNet, which is our... Um, <laughs> Uh, is our maternity record, which is uh, uh, accessible from all of our acute trusts and women hold on their phones so they, they, they can take it wherever they go. And we have a co-located maternity helpline. So all the external calls that used to go to Labour Ward now go to the ambulance service where we have a rotating strategic midwife who takes those calls. And the impact of that has been to actually create an extra person per shift on Labour Ward. Instead of having somebody doing this the whole time, actually those calls are taken. And with a 30% reduction in conveyances to hospitals, which is a massive impact for women. We've got a Children's Workforce Academy, which is doing leadership and OD across health and care for people that work in children's services. And then from April, we're going to move to a single integrated commissioning team for our children's services, which will be led by the local authority. So the interesting thing is, what is different about being an ICS? So if you look at how we would have done this five years ago, so five years ago, somebody would have come and said, what are you going to do for children's? And we would have gone, oh, we'll look at the NHS pathway, we'll set up a community clinic, put a paediatrician out in a GP surgery and think we've done marvellously well. And yes, that, that's still quite a sensible thing to do, but in terms of improving outcomes of the population, that will improve your outcomes by 10%. And we know that unless you work with partners, with education, with health, uh, and do the preventative work, you're not actually going to unlock the full potential to improve the health inequalities of your population. So the working in partnership and actually addressing the wider determinants of health are the thing, for me, that make ICSs different. And that, for me, is why... We, oh, that's why we should all be in an ICS. <laughs> Thanks, Claire. <laughs> now, these things are not mutually exclusive. <laughs> ICPs can be within ICSs. So, Matthew, do you want to talk to us about what's going on in Croydon? Yeah, thanks, Helen. Uh, so, I'm Matthew Kershaw. I'm the Chief Executive of Croydon Health Services uh, Trust, but I'm also what's called the place-based leader for health uh, in Croydon. Uh, and my job is to run the trust as an organisation, but more importantly, particularly in today's context, to try and create a system of health in an integrated care partnership in Croydon. Uh, and to do that, we've done something uh, quite different in that we are, in essence, running Croydon as a single entity. Uh, some people think that I'm both Chief Executive of the Trust and Accountable Officer for the CCG. That's not true. Uh, it has been said, but it's not true, uh, not least because that's at this stage illegal. Um, uh, <laughs> We do many things differently, but that's not one of the things that we want to try and do differently. Uh, uh, what I do do, though, is manage the delegated authority from what will be South West London CCG come April the 1st, 2020. So in a few weeks' time, we will have a delegated uh, budget from South West London CCG delegating resources, responsibility, decision-making uh, to a local place-based committee, which I will run with uh, the chair of uh, the Trust and also uh, the clinical chair of the Croydon Place within South West London CCG. So it is about bringing power back to Croydon um, for decisions to be taken closer to the population that we serve because we believe very passionately that ICSs definitely have a place and we work strongly within our South West London ICS <coughs> but we think uh, that evidence suggests that most transformation happens at a place level uh, and a neighbourhood level and not at an ICS level. So what we're trying to do is keep as much uh, responsibility and authority uh, locally within uh, Croydon. Now to support that, we've got a bunch of uh, single executives working across the totality of uh, the Croydon health space. So we have a, a single executive team uh, working across the whole piece. Uh, now that's been quite tricky to uh, implement uh, and we're now at that point and from April uh, of this year we'll be running it as that Croydon single system. Uh, now we think that's important uh, in Croydon for the reasons I've just described about transformation happening at that place but also because there are some conditions in Croydon that we think make it even more important. So Croydon is a very uh, connected place. Uh, if Surrey Heartlands doesn't feel quite like a, a real place. Uh, Croydon definitely does, I can promise you. Uh, uh, it's a 
400,000 population, it's very diverse, it has huge uh, health inequalities, uh, it has scale and challenge uh, abound. What it also has is a very, very strong sense of place, strongest sense of place of anywhere I've worked in 28 years in the health service. And that is a very, very positive thing uh, except when it's going badly, uh, because there's nowhere else to go. Uh, so it's a bit like when it's going well with your family, it's fantastic. When it isn't, and you've got nowhere else to go, then you've only got yourselves to look at to, so to solve the problems. And that's what we're trying to do, because Croydon has had a history of not actually working very well together. And when you're so close and not working together well, then actually the people who suffer are the patients that we serve and the staff who work for us and we're trying to change that by the way that we're working going forward so it's really important for us that we take this opportunity and we think it is a real opportunity uh, now we're building on something that has existed for a couple of three years something called the one croydon alliance which is about the health and care partners in uh, croydon working together uh, that's the start of this but we're definitely building on it. Uh, and we're building on it because we think if we create a system within Croydon uh, that works collectively together, we can deliver better outcomes. Better outcomes for the services we run now. So we're doing a lot of work on elective transformation. <coughs> we're doing a lot of work on emergency care transformation, uh, which we don't think we could do if we weren't uh, as connected uh, working as a single system as we are. We also are trying to change how the finances and the funding works uh, Croydon has historically worked in a significant deficit position. We now have a single control total. We have a single plan. We have no purchase of provider split in Croydon uh, to speak of. Uh, and that's freeing up a lot of time and changing the dynamic for many, many people uh, around the board table, but more importantly, in departments uh, between the trust and the CCG, who are now working together in a way that they haven't done hand in glove for many, many years. And we think that's going to deliver better outcomes on an elective pathway and on an emergency pathway, uh, and that's really crucial. The third aspect of the actual change on the ground is we think this helps us with working on the health inequalities agenda and, crucially, uh, the social determinants of health. So the Marmot report that was out this week that basically said it's all got worse over the last 10 years, part of the job of the uh, Integrated Care Partnership in Croydon is to start to turn that around in Croydon, and we haven't done that yet, and that's the next big job for us to do, I believe. Uh, and so to do that, you do need three things, I think, uh, to make the integration really work. Uh, we don't want to talk much about governance, but governance is a part of it. You do need to have a, a well thought through system that is supporting and making this work. But that needs to be secondary to the two big things that need to be in place for integration to work. The first and most important is relationships. You can't do any of this without having good working relationships. And I've worked a lot in the health service and always thought I had good working relationships with colleagues. Actually, I think what I did was pretend to myself I had good working relationships with colleagues. And then I used to go back to wherever I was working and slag off the people who I was then working with. Uh, that's not actually about real relationships. That's about playing at it. For integration to work, you absolutely have to be trustful, you have to be honest, and you have to work together. Because if you haven't got that, you've got nothing. So you need relationships, you need governance, you also need to be getting on and doing some work. Because one of the big risks of this is it's a lot of people talking about working together differently, and the people who are actually doing the work on the ground don't see it at all. So it's something about translating the ideas of integration into the reality of life for patients, the public, and staff. And if we can do that, then we'll really be doing something transformational for Croydon, and that's clearly uh, what my job uh, is. Now, our state at the moment is that we're just about to go live uh, with our big changes in April of this year. Uh, in October, we're then bringing in uh, the local authority, who are already around the table in the discussions, but in October, we're gonna start piloting doing some pooled budgets and aligned budgets with the council, because by April 21, uh, we want to have uh, the adult services of the council completely and utterly managed in tandem with the health side of uh, the situation in Croydon. So we'll have a health and care board uh, running everything in Croydon with local authority officers and councillors working with uh, lay members and non-executives and the single executive team to manage the situation overall in Croydon. And then we bring after that children's services in as well. So it's quite an ambitious objective, but we want to create a single health <coughs> and care uh, environment in Croydon, completely connected, uh, working working for the benefit of our patients, uh, our staff uh, and the public that we serve. Thanks. Thank you.
Uh, it's interesting what you say about relationships. I've always thought that good relationships can be measured by what you say about your partners when they're not in the room. Mm -hmm. So, Simone, do you want to talk to us about how primary care networks are developing in your part of the world? Absolutely. So, I'm Simone Yule. I'm a GP partner in uh, the Blackmore Rail Partnership, which is oh, in rural North Dorset. Uh, we're 27,000 patients, having merged about five years ago through necessity. Uh, not through wish, I have to say, but five years on, it, we were in a very different pet place and very pleased to be merged. I'm also the clinical director of the Vale Network. Uh, we're about 40,000 patients, and that's actually just two practices coming together, um, ourselves and another practice of 13,000. So that sounds quite straightforward, but historically, we never really talked. We work very differently. Um, so actually, just um, being brought together in a room, um, having some form of common purpose has actually improved our relationships and started to build some trust. But there's a long way to go. And I think the theme through all of this is about relationships and trust. And it really doesn't happen overnight. Um, but it's not all about GPs. And I think that's a really important thing for me about primary care networks. It's about collaboration. So we were very clear that actually one of the reasons networks came into existence was to you know, um, relieve pressure in primary care. And how do we do that? Well, we have to empower our patients and we have to think differently about you know, how we deal with patients, how we treat them, and sort of encourage them to be part of the solution. So we have a mission statement, and we just talk about a collaborative and a holistic approach to the health and the well-being uh, through, through really patient empowerment and sort of um, self-care. Um, one of the things we did initially was we just gave all of our staff lanyards, so they all have a sense of community. Even if they're the community staff, they're not employed by us. They work across both sites, but it's just those little things that start to make people feel different. Um, and the one thing we had our first big meeting and we decided that we'd have a joint Christmas party. Sounds crazy, but actually that's the first thing to building those relationships much better, possibly after a glass of wine, than sitting around a table in a, in a formal environment. So, um, yeah, it's, it's been quite a journey. I think we'd already started some of that work with Prime Care Home. Um, you know, we were already thinking about the 30 to 50,000 population and the benefits that that has. We know that, you know, with, with teams working around that size, you're small enough to care, but you're large enough to cope. And I think we've seen with some of the integration of our teams and the additional workforce that we've started to recruit, it's really improved um, morale and resilience, I would say. Apart from that, what have we been doing within the network? It's just, I think it's given us a bit of time to start to think differently. We've been working with the All Together Better program, um, and I, we've been absolutely gobsmacked by the, um, the patient response to becoming health champions. And, and I'm just humbled by how much of them will give up their time. We've got mindfulness groups, you know, um, trained psychologists that have a job, but they're still coming into the practice. And, and I think that's the difference, is that rather than be siloed independent contractors, we're moving to the, the thoughts that actually, perhaps we do need to, need to involve, you know, our partners, our patients, and our communities to work differently. So we've, we've, we've worked with our social prescribers um, and our health champions, and we've now got a whole menu, menu of well-being activities so that, as GPs, we, we can signpost patients to. And again, I think there's been evidence for this um, through the All Together Better programme. Up to 40% of patients come to the GP with a non-medical need. You know, they come to me about their debts, and I'm like, well, I don't know about that, but, you know. But now I can signpost them to somebody who can really support them. So I think that will make a real difference to our, our workforce pressures uh, with time. But it is early days, I have to say. Um, population health management. So we've been working uh, with Optum initially, looking at real-time data and actually focusing some of our um, frontline staff to work differently in a more proactive manner. I think this is one of the big things that I have a bugbear with, that the NHS is wonderful, but it's incredibly reactive. And actually, on the front line, we need to be more proactive and get out there and sort of catch these people before they fall over. So we've been identifying people at risk in our frail cohorts of patients and directing our nurse practitioners to, to call them up, cold call them. Some of them are like, why are you calling me? I'm fine. But a lot of them are really, really welcoming. And the girls then will go out. And actually, we've developed care plans it's not just tick boxes, it's about actually what matters most to me and really using that personalisation agenda. So I think that's been, been really powerful. 
We've also have got some other roles. Um, it has been quite difficult to recruit, and so this is work in progress. And I think when people seem to think that networks are going to solve everything, it's going to take time. So relationships, trust, and time. And, you know, it, it, it is work in progress. But we have got a first contact mental health worker. We've got a first contact physio. And we've got a network pharmacist who's just starting to do medication reviews. So we're starting to see a change. Excuse me. And then there's the community. And this, for me, is the most exciting part of, the, of networks. It's actually... Whenever I've gone out into the community, it's usually to tell a negative story. We're closing beds. The CSR says we've got to do this differently. And, and it's been really difficult. But going out to the community, we've had a meeting. We've invited everybody we could think of, uh, police, schools, um, local authority, mental health, um, oh, everybody, and, and just got them around the table and said, OK, as a community, as part of our network, how can we work as a team to support you and our patients in the population. We ha we've done a piece of work around rural food poverty because actually there's a lot of food poverty in rural areas as, as well as the more urban areas. And so we've now got um, a, a group together. We're looking at developing a charity so that we can fundraise to have a local pantry, which is not just a food bank. It gives people a sense of purpose. They pay a small amount of money. They get... £25 worth of food, but actually then they can volunteer and they, they get supported into food choices and, and how to cook. So that's when the, we would have never have done that without the network. We, we wouldn't have just, we just wouldn't have gone out to the community. And we've also fundraised for a trishaw, one of, one of the sort of tricycles that, that are powered, um, and we've just bought one. So we're going to take that out to the, the residents of our care homes and get them out in the air. You know, that, that feeling of the wind in your hair type thing. We, we know there are other places that do it, and that, there's an evidence for that. So hoping to give our population more of a sense of, of well-being. So I think that's probably it. I think I would say a, ma a word of caution. Mine sounds really optimistic, but sometimes it's really difficult, just the relationships between practices and how we've worked over years. And we're just two practices. So if you've got five, six, seven, eight practices coming together, some historically don't work together, don't even like each other, and that now they're expected that they're going to have they're going to be working together to deliver service specifications. We mustn't lose sight of that, that relationships and trust are really important. But I think it is an opportunity, and I'm really happy to be part of it. Brilliant. I mean, I've got visions of fleets of tricycles going through the Dorset countryside. Have you seen Gold Hill? <laughs> it's <really steep>. Yes, yes. <laughs> Nikki, do you want to give us a perspective from the, from the National Yes, I wanted to reassure something first, that we weren't going to put tricycles into the service specifications, <laughs> um, which uh, I know some of you will have been wondering about. Um, hi, I'm Nikki. I'm a GP in South London and Medical Director for Primary Care at NHS England and NHS Improvement. And I think in one sense, the conversation could sort of stop here, because everything that's happening is happening at exactly the right level. There was a, uh, there was a moment between Claire and Matthew when I thought there was a bit of a dragon's den opportunity to see um, what bit of the system you might want to work in. But actually, I think for us, it's very much. Uh, it is very different. It feels different nationally, but it feels different across the spectrum um, of uh, systems and ICEPs and primary care networks. And if I do what Claire did, which is take us back five years, would we have had a national engagement about our specifications for primary care networks? Probably not. Um, so I think we are in a different position. What we're seeing, um, both nationally and locally, is a different type of leadership, something that, uh, that, that feels much more locally owned, much more distributed, much more about um, recognising what the needs of a community is. Um, I highly recommend you stay on and listen to Fazana later on. He'll talk about Bapti, isn't it? Your young man who died by knife crime. And because of that young man, Fazana's created a social movement in her patch to start to tackle some of the things that have really been difficult in her area. Um, Kat, who's a nursing CD in Yeovil, has embedded lifestyle medicine into the work that they do across their PCN. That wouldn't have happened unless those groups had come together. But the themes that run through each of the, each of the introductions so far are very much about time and trust. Um, when we started to um, set out the direction of travel for primary care last year, so I uh, appreciate that was after the primary care network, uh, after, after the primary care home sort of uh, philosophy really was bedded in in some areas, um, I started training for a marathon. And it was almost purposeful because I wanted to see how long it would take. Um, because this stuff does take time. We can't do it overnight. And we 
very much recognise that, and I think it's really important to say that. Um, it's about complex relationships, relationships that won't have already sort of had the time and space to understand how to work together. And we want to create that, but what we have got is, for once, I think, a level playing field, a level opportunity to access a playing field for patients, for communities, that's really set out through the primary care network specification. Um, it gives a chance to see what could be happening over the coming years in each of the systems that we're trying to support and, and develop, um, and very much with us sort of stepping back and allowing that local ownership. Um, Helen, you asked about what we can, uh, what we could inadvertently hinder, um, and I think it is that you know, I mean, we we have a sense of um, wanting to see pace, wanting to see outcomes. There's lots of reasons for that, and Matt spoke about things like the 50 million appointments and whether patients really are satisfied, whether they really are confident about the care that they're getting. This stuff does matter, and we know that there are patients who are calling 200 times in the morning to get an appointment, and we need to be able to move away from that. But I'm hopeful, I'm going to be optimistic because I think that is the way that we're going to be. I know that Leah is here from our, um, our local RAG Pulse and uh, I don't want to be quoted as saying I'm overly optimistic, <laughs> but I, am, I have a balanced level of optimism because actually we have to stabilise um, what's happening in general practice and we have to push on, we have to create a model of care that works for our workforce, which is changing, but also for our population. My children will access care very differently from the way that people currently access care, although I think they probably would like to go on those tricycles. So uh, <laughs> let's see. <laughs> That's great. Thanks, Nikki, and thank all of you. So I'll open it up to questions from the, the floor in a moment. But before I do that, I'm, I'm going to try and frame my question positively, taking, taking Nikki's cue. Uh, you've all been really positive about what you're doing in your, your local communities and the, the difference that you're making and, and actually what you can do now that you couldn't have done a few years ago. So I suppose my, my question would be, what else could the national system do to enable you to do even more of that, to to not, using Nikki's words, to, to not hinder, to not get in the way. You might want to pick up on the, the question that um, Nick asked the Secretary of State in terms of any potential legislation in the future. Is the legislation that you'd like to see? Is there legislation that you would possibly not like to see? I would Anything... be writing things down. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else that you think could be, could be even better to take away the barriers that make it more difficult for you to do what you want to do than it should be? How do you want to start? Oh, should I start? start? Um, so... <laughs> So a lot of the, everything we've done, we've done without a change in legislation, and it's all been done through influence, it's been through relationships, and it's been incredibly hard to achieve, and it always feels that you're only ever one conversation from a disaster, often. Mm. Um, if you'd asked me six months ago about legislative change, I'd be, no, 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 it's all fine, we don't need any of that, it's absolutely fine. And over the last sort of couple of months, I've started thinking, oh, it would make it a lot easier if we were actually a thing, even down to just employing staff, even down to um, the, the conflict that still sits there, between, or the, the tension that's there between the role of the ICS and the role of the CCG, and then the role of the members, membership within the CCG, the roles of governors within the acute trust, the roles, uh, the statutory duties of the boards that sit within. Uh, and over the last six months, we've done a lot of work with our non-exec and our lay community, really, in terms of moving to organisations, viewing themselves as organisations within a system rather than organisations on their own. Matthew? Uh, so I'd say I'd legislate for flexibility uh, rather than prescription. So I definitely don't want a blueprint. One of the joys of the work that we're doing is there isn't a way of doing it that we're being told to that looks great somewhere else. But doesn't look great in Croydon. What we're doing is creating what we think works best in Croydon for the people of Croydon by the people who work there. Uh, so for me, the thing that the centre could do most to help would be to continue to allow that flexibility to exist. Mm -hmm. Now, flexibility isn't without a check and a balance. There's got to be some process and some guidance and some limitations i accept that but as much flexibility as we have at this moment the better i think uh, and that if there was one request i'd make is don't write the rules too tightly because the moment you do you'll drive out the transformation and the enthusiasm in places um, because it will look like we're being done too and quite a lot of people will walk away or turn off at that moment so i'd say keep it open at this moment and not close it down okay. <laughs> So my wish list, I think, would be um, a system solution to, to shared IT. We're, we're, we are battling, we are really battling um, across organisations to share IT. We've, we've been a pilot for something called Shared Admin with System 1. And unfortunately, when we turned it on, the provider turned it on for everyone 
across all of our sites and both practices. And so everybody could see everything. And it created a huge amount of fear that actually this wasn't a network, this was a merger and nobody had told them. So I think a system solution to shared <laughs> IT and something to do with um, how we get around different organisations' governance when we're working together. So, for example, we're trying to set up a, a community leg club modelled on the Lindsay Leg Club. Uh, and our community nurses said, have said they can't do that because their organisational governance is different to the governance behind the Lindsay Leg Club. And it's just like, but it's for the care of the patient. You know, so how, how can we get the, a solution to those sorts of issues? Okay. Any thoughts? Do I, get, do I get to make a wish? You can make a wish. Do. Fantastic. Um, look, I, th I think they're all things that we absolutely um, feel and recognise, and there, there is a definite cons consensus nationally that, that you know we have to um, give out uh, the power, the uh, responsibility, the accountability, um, and very much the concept of system by default. And, and I don't think that becomes an acronym, which is wonderful. I don't think it quite works. It hasn't yet. Um, but very it's much speedy. starting <laughs> to deliver care in the right level, for the right level, for the right part of the system. Um, and I think, I think that recognition is absolutely there. And that's very much the work that Amanda's been leading to say, how do we, how do we start to do that much more freely? Um, uh, Matthew, you know that um, we're, we're absolutely in the same place. We've had this conversation before. I want to see that flexibility. And right now, I'm delighted that Yasmin in West London, who's a PCNCD, is running a Moroccan cookathon. Um, I, you know, I'm, I, I would much rather that's what she's spending her time doing right now, because actually she's also doing a whole bunch of other stuff to look out, look after her community with her community, uh, than sitting in a kind of endless meeting. So um, I, I think we can help do that, and I think we can help sort of um, show that some of the things that um, might be being asked for are, are not the right things and, and help to just guide and set the, set the tone for the rest of the system. Thank you. So, your turn. Questions from the floor? There's one right at the back there. You can say who you are as you ask your question. Um, thanks. Really, really interesting um, discussion so far. Neil Tester from the Richmond Group of National Health and Care Charities. Um, and just reflecting really on Chris Whitty's final slide earlier on saying we're putting multi-morbidity at the top of the list of things that we're not currently on a trajectory to fix um, we're thinking a lot about the experience of people with multiple conditions at the moment and see lots of potential uh, at ICS level and particularly at PCN level to address that Simone gave that example about uh, a PCN pharmacist and medication reviews Matthew talked about that focus he wants to move on to about the marmot agenda so it feels like there's loads of potential there but I'd be interested to hear if the panel are already sort of seeing visibility in those systems at, at those levels uh, of multiple conditions and if not what would be the things that would enable, enable us to get that really necessary focus who wants to pick that one up Ooh. well i think i could possibly mm -hmm. start i think for us population health management just using that the data analytics so that you can identify those people with those long-term conditions those comorbidities and then you can actually you know focus in on them in a proactive way there's also that thing about prevention, you know, and the, the, the one condition that runs through all of the comorbidities when you look at the data is, is hypertension. And the problem is, as somebody said to me, hypertension is not very sexy. So, you know, it, it, it doesn't really get, it, it just gets pushed to a side, but we need to be, get better at prevention, you know, much, much earlier on, I think. And then we can look at, you know, how we then are able to reduce the amount of comorbidity. So I'd say the short answer to the question is the desire is strong, uh, the delivery is less so, uh, if I'm being absolutely honest. Uh, but if you don't have the desire and the will uh, and the relationships to try and do some of this stuff, because it can't be done by one bit of the system, it has to be done by a totality of the system, you're definitely not going to get there. So the desire is there, it's part of what we talk about a lot. Uh, it isn't really happening in a transformative way at this stage. I think what would help is allowing our system work to carry on in the way that it is because it is on the agenda we will get to it but we've had to do a whole load of stuff to get the thing set up in the first place now we need to move on to exactly that sort of thing so hopefully in the next year or so that will be the thing that we spend most of our time talking about but that hasn't been thus far it has to be said i'm just going to challenge slightly the concept of levels 
So I don't view them as, as having an ICS level, an ICP level, and a PC. I view it as we are a collection of organisations and a collection of populations. And it's about what is the right population that you need to deliver that aspect of care. So I know I talked about the ICS, but I was really talking about things that we did across a population of 1.3 million. So in terms of multimorbidity, it, it's, it's the population health management piece. It's, it's making sure that we are providing the right care to the right people that need it in the right place. So I think that's absolutely the role and the thread that goes through for whichever population you're looking at. Quite right. Thank you. Now I could see Claire had a question. Yeah, it's not really a question. It's a comment. Uh, so I've been around this for 30 years and my practice is currently runs about 15 practices. We're a multi-site. I really hate the word models. I find it, I find it really awful. What we should be doing is defining what patients need in terms of access, continuity and prevention, then setting a series of standards against that and then the model will fall out. Uh, you know, it'll be different. It'll be different in rural Margate than it will for inner city London. And what I worry about is we get fixated on models. And then I'm not criticising because I think what you're doing is fantastic. But we get fixated on models. And the, the current model is the PCN. I don't know what the next model will be or the next model. As if it's the model that drives the change. It's not the model that drives the change. It's what drives the change is determining what patients and finally, 15 years ago, we had, in our practice, a 50,000 population. We, we worked with our neighbouring practices. We shared an on-call rotor 24-7. We shared staff. We had about 50 uh, allied health professionals, including the community beat officer, and, uh, because that's what we worked. And general practice will do that. But it can only do it if we have a stable general practice population. And at the moment, we haven't got a stable. We've got a peripatetic locum uh, population, certainly in London, maybe not the other way around. So what I think that we need to be addressing is how to bring the populate, how to bring the workforce in, and then how to determine what we're going to deliver against a set of standards, rather than fix a model and put little square boundaries around it and say, hunky-dory, we're all going to work, you know, happily together. So it's, it's, it's just an, an a comment. Nikki, you want to talk on the model side? Look, Claire, I, I wouldn't ever disagree with you. Uh, <laughs> 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 I, I, I do agree with what you're saying on, on how we should not be defining sort of models of care, but I, I'd often say, and particularly when I'm out in general practice and in networks around the country, is, you know, sort of forget about what it's called. We've, we, we, we're always talking about the three-letter acronym and whether it's a primary care network or something else. It doesn't matter. What matters is the relationship and whether you are able to take that population focus and create and support the workforce. And you and I have shared a number of exchanges recently. I'm making you leave the room. <laughs> um, you know, we've, we've shared some, uh, some exchanges recently about how worried we are about our workforce, and I'm, I'm absolutely there with you. But what I want us to do is outside of some of the national politics in which we've all got to kind of manage is actually focus on what we're doing locally and, and stay away from the acronyms and the kind of confusion about whether it's this type of model or that. We'll do our best to stay away from that as well and um, allow this to flourish because I, I genuinely think it can. And it's the first time we've got five years and probably more of consistency of a way of working and, um, and that's what we've got to make happen. Thanks, Nikki. Now, I could see that James and Ian had questions. Has anybody else got a question? We've got about another eight minutes. So any other questions? Um, so we'll go for, we'll take three. We'll take Ian and James and the lady in blue. <laughs> Hi, Ian. Mm -hmm. HS England Improved. Um, fear it's another quick comment rather than just your wish list question. <laughs> and uh, I agree. I don't think, I think legislation can help a bit, but only up to a point. I need flex. And it's... The three-letter act, as you say, we've had hundreds of those. Um, wish list, I think the obvious one is actually around the money. Um, so obviously, we've had the long-term funding settlement. We've had further manifesto cash, actually 85% of the total additional funding promised in the Tory manifesto actually was for health, specifically for some workforce issues. I think the critical thing is seeing what the HEE budget settlement will be and whether we get a multi-year funding settlement. I think the other critical one is premises. 
and that's a huge OD opportunity. We know we haven't got fit for purpose, primary community estate, let alone hospitals. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have not just 40 new hospitals, but 1,250, say, uh, fully fit for purpose, new or refurbished primary care hubs, um, as well as then the tech funding, the public health, and the social care funding that we've discussed. Thanks, Ian. <laughs> Who's got the microphone next? I've got the lady in blue there, and we've got James. <laughs> Here. Oh, different lady in blue. <laughs> um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I was quite intrigued at um, the discussions around uh, how the, you know, the panel are actually working to prov provide services within their local communities. Um, and I think it's about time around demographics. Um, Claire talked about uh, the gypsy population in Surrey and the need to provide services to f meet that um, demographics of patients. Um, I think it's about time with the NHS in the sense that we spend so much money in time to design services that do not always work for every community. So I think going forward, this is really good because this is a typical example of looking at the different um, areas, providing services for the local community for the, um, to, to fit in with what their local community actually needs within the uh, NHS. Um, and as a senior sort of NHS manager, I think it's about time we started working towards that. So I quite recommend that. I know there's you know, issues about the new models of healthcare, but we need to dress it up into something anyway, in any case. But I think that's really good. I'm quite impressed with that. Thank you. GP in London. Um, I just wanted to draw attention to the Pulse headlines that came out today saying that there's 260-odd uh, fewer, fewer full-time equivalent GPs this year. And actually, the PCN sort of idea was all about stabilising general practice. Mm. And yes, we know that there's going to be a lot of allied health professionals coming in, but we also want to avoid the situation of role substitution. So actually, how do we bring the focus back on you know, recruiting and retaining our workforce and making it a really enjoyable place to work. Thank you. So kind of connecting those things, we've got Ian's wish to get a, a budget settlement for HEE. We've got some questions about how we actually think about the workforce differently and some, something about the other, the, the infrastructure and the premises as an opportunity for doing things differently and for doing things differently in a way that really meets the needs of local populations and their different demographics. So any kind of reflections on those? Yeah, I mean, I think I, uh, that thing about the... the reflecting the local population's needs. I mean, if you think about, colloquially, my context, Croydon sits in southwest London, uh, STP, ICS from April, hopefully, uh, and I have to say, Croydon is very, very distinct to Kingston and Richmond and Wimbledon in lots and lots of ways. And the big part of the agenda for us is within a framework that is set at ICS level, which we are very supportive of, having enough flexibility to respond to the needs of our local population, which are very different. Uh, and there's, I think, plenty of examples historically where decisions taken at a two and a half million population level don't quite match the specific needs of our population of 400,000. And we're really, really keen to take this opportunity not to go rogue and have the independent state of Croydon, although there are some people who would quite like that, uh, but seriously, to do things that matter to the population that we serve. Uh, now, that doesn't mean ignoring what's happening elsewhere. It doesn't mean running 180 degrees away from it. It does mean, however, having some flexibility and ability to make choices that matter to the patients and the public that we look after. And I think this is a good opportunity to do it, as long as we connect up to the system at a bigger level so we're not going off and doing things that ultimately are going to be detrimental to the bigger piece because we are part of that wider system as well. And I think it gives us an opportunity to do that. It's not easy, but it's absolutely what we should be doing. Um, so my reflections from the comments are very much how NHS focused the comments are and also how our wish list was as well. Uh, and particularly when we come to workforce issues, the people plan is about NHS workforce, but to deliver the long-term plan, we need to do it in partnership. So it's about social care, it's about voluntary sector, it's about unpaid carers as well. So uh, my reflections are that I completely agree with all the wishes, but we just need to be really careful. If we undermine those partnerships, we won't deliver the things that we need to do. 
Any reflections, Susan? So I'm probably looking through rose-tinted spectacles a little bit, but I suppose my thoughts were, actually, if the work we're doing with our social prescribing really works, and if we're re redirecting that 30 to 40% of our people that do attend the surgery very, very regularly, um, actually, if we're directing them somewhere differently, then actually that will make a difference to our workforce pressure and, and how we recruit. And I suppose, as a GP, we can't recruit GPs at the moment. So we, we've gone down, we've had to innovate and go down the nurse practitioner route. And it's been, it's been amazing. We've got about eight nurse practitioners. We've got a nurse practitioner partner now um, within our organisation. And it's helped us to look, look at things differently. So I think, and um, this won't be popular, that perhaps we just need to shift the focus away again, as I said earlier, about it being all about GPs. And even um, Mr Hancock's language, he talks about GPs, 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 but actually nurse practitioners, nurse practitioners, nurse practitioners, <laughs> you know, they do a very good job. And we, we could be more of a GP consultant um, and, you know, have a, have a whole ancillary staff do, doing most of what we do. When I'm in surgery, most of the things I see, they probably, they don't need me. They, a nurse practitioner does them even better because they're more thorough than I am. Um, and then there's the thing about premises. Um, we had... Um, uh, uh, Councillor Keith Cunliffe came to talk to us yesterday about the Wigan deal and the first thing that he did to save money was he got rid of a lot of premises and this may not be popular but actually why don't we use premises differently so if we want a hub why don't we look in the community and see what else is out there and certainly with our, food, our, our local pantry we're, we're lo using the local authority uh, they've got lots of dormant rooms so, so I think it is about thinking differently Great. Nikki, you get 10 I seconds. I can't, I can't even, uh, uh, I won't add to that. I mean, nursing, 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 absolutely underline that. But um, on, on the premises piece, we've got a real issue about um, sustainability in our environment. And I'm, I am slightly anxious that we end up on another set of building programmes. So let's, let's look at our communities in the true sense of the wider community and make sure that we're responsible with what we're doing and how we're spending our money and using our assets. Um, and um, this, is, look, this is our chance to get a truly diverse and representative um, workforce and leadership um, at the table and it's uh, time to embrace it. Right, thank you. I'm, I'm really struck by the, what everybody said about the connections that you feel to the community in a way that perhaps in previous iterations of the NHS working with itself, we haven't done. And also by the, the, the real recognition of the need to build relationships and build trust, and that takes time. But sadly, we are out of time now, and Nigel and Fiona are going to come and uh, take our place. So thank you all.